Um, my guess is that most of you are here because you're already committed to the priority of wanting to get the gospel out to these um, areas. I guess one of the challenges that we face within British evangelicalism is those who perhaps most need to hear what's being said um, aren't here. And I think one of the challenges is how do we convey that priority to the wider constituency? That's certainly something within um, FIEC that we are vitally concerned to do. We are committed to the priority of wanting to get the gospel into um, hard places. And that's because we are, first of all, gospel uh, people. We are to some extent embarrassed that British evangelicalism is so overwhelmingly middle class. We are concerned to see the gospel going to every community and uh, that 45% of the people have much less chance of hearing the gospel uh, disturbs us. So it is part of our concern to want to make it a priority to get the gospel out to these areas. We believe that that's actually a biblical imperative. The Bible says that we should be concerned about the unreached places. The Bible says that we should be concerned about the poor. We need to make sure that we have um, a special priority uh, for those um, uh, areas. And to some extent, it's in the DNA of FIEC as well. 70 years ago, FIEC would have been an overwhelmingly working class group, basically because that was the nature of British nonconformity. Um, many people in FIEC churches would look back to a working class background, perhaps of their parents or of their grandparents. Many of us in uh, FIEC who are middle class feel just as intimidated by the upper classes as those of you um, who come from other social backgrounds. It's a part of our DNA. Many of the uh, churches that are working in um, hard places are already part of the FIEC family. And it's been great to see so many of you who are FIEC who are here today. So it's in our DNA. And as we've been working on revitalizing the FIEC over the last um, eight years, it's uh, been pushed uh, more and more to our agenda to want to see how can we support um, our gospel ministry into those hard uh, places. We're 600 churches, and I think that, that what we are able to offer is harnessing the energy and the support of those 600 churches to work together to get the gospel out to the nation in all different communities. Our strap line is independent churches working together to reach the nation for Christ. And uh, we mean it, and that's what we want to see being implemented um, over the coming um, years. So the question is, what can we do? How can we make it a priority? What does that actually look like in practice? And at one level, I feel something of a fraud because I've been asked to speak on that. I don't yet know the answers, not fully. So I'm not here to present some great plan. All I'm here to do is share some of the things we're thinking about because we urgently need your help to know how we can take it forwards. So let me suggest some of the things that we're trying to do that I think will be about making it a priority um, in the future. Firstly, we want to listen to those who are working in hard areas. I and a large section of the FIEC constituency don't pretend to understand the challenges of working in working class communities, and it's certainly not our place to say how it ought to be done. But what we have the opportunity to do is to listen to those who are working in those communities, to hear about the challenges, the struggles, the opportunities, the pains, as in fact we've very eloquently done this morning. We need to start by being those who listen. As I said, there are a number of FIEC churches on the ground in those areas, which as a constituency gives us that great opportunity to hear from those who are experienced practitioners. One of the key things we're wanting to do is set up a, a consultation, a group, of those who are ministering in those areas, we've identified maybe 35 or 40 key people to be able to hear from them how we can help support this kind of ministry, to help develop a strategy. We want to learn how not to be patronising. We want to learn to understand the pain that's been inflicted. So much of it unintentional, but we start by listening. Um, actually, in that process that's begun already, I've discovered a number of things. I've discovered there's a variety of contexts for reaching those from a working class background. It's not identical. There are, in some areas where there are sort of our working class estates, in many areas, the challenge is actually reaching mixed communities. And it's not the existence of estates, but it's churches that are only reaching a section of their particular community. 
And that, I think, presents different uh, challenges. I've discovered there's a diversity of approaches. There are those who see the absolute key thing, raising up indigenous workers. There are those who see the key thing as sending in more middle-class missionaries. Those working on the ground identify different strategies that they think are important to take it forwards. What's been clear from everybody is no matter what their strategy is, they're all saying they desperately need resources of money and people. And they feel undervalued and excluded. So we need to uh, listen. And a strategy that will help advance the gospel into these hard places will be multifaceted. It will involve different approaches. It will involve planting. It will involve revitalizing. It will involve helping existing churches to reach out to a wider community and become more diversified. We want to listen to know how that can be um, done. I think it's also important that that process is two-way, that those who are working in harder communities can, in a sense, listen and understand um, those working in middle-class communities. I think many of those um, in middle-class communities, not that they don't care about gospel work in working-class communities. I would suggest that many working in that situation feel desperately inadequate about it. They feel threatened. They feel guilty. They feel fearful of going into those contexts. And uh, in some measure, they also feel trapped by their own cultural context and inability to escape it. There's a two-way conversation to be had. So listen. Second thing we want to do is to challenge. We want to challenge the whole constituency to care about the gospel in uh, hard communities. The great strength of the FIEC is um, those 600 churches. What we want is for that whole constituency to be concerned about the uh, cause of the gospel in harder communities. As I've said, we think that that is a, a, a biblical um, imperative. We want them all to be praying, to be giving, to be sending. We want it to be on every agenda of every uh, church. That doesn't mean that every church will be necessarily doing it or contributing in the same way. But we want the whole, whole constituency to own and support um, uh, the challenge. I think one of our great tasks as we, as the central FIEC staff, engage with the churches as a whole is to keep putting that challenge before them. Because really what we're talking about here at this conference is nothing less than trying to change evangelical culture as a whole. To put something onto the agenda that hasn't been as high up the agenda as it ought to have been. And we have the opportunity to be able to uh, do that. We want to make it a priority but I hope you don't mind if I say this. Making something a priority doesn't mean that it automatically becomes the priority. I think this is one of the challenges of a Christian ministry. We want it to be a priority. That doesn't mean that something will inevitably be the priority. Across Christian ministry, there's a danger that all of us, no matter where we are, where God has called us to be, we tend to think that our place is the most important and the most strategic. That's just inevitable. But it seems to me as we think about how we will try to reach every community in the UK, most of the time our approach needs to be both and rather than either or. We need to not set up a false antithesis. Making something a priority, which is absolutely right, is not the same as making it the priority, although there is no doubt that there needs to be a rebalancing. And certainly within FIEC over the years, we've constantly sought to allocate resources and time disproportionately to the areas that are in greatest need, whether that be parts of the country or types of churches. We want the priority to be embedded in our structure, in our strategy, in our communication, in our conferences, so that the whole constituency is behind it. Thirdly, we want to promote we want to promote across the constituency and more widely the opportunities, needs and initiatives for gospel work into poorer communities. I think, again, that is something that we are able to do. We're able to tell the stories. We're able to provide a platform for those who are working in those areas to speak of how the Lord is at work, to speak of their needs. 
And to some extent, we've already been able to do that through our leaders' conferences and gatherings. That's one of the reasons why we're supporting this conference. In actual fact, it's hugely encouraging to the middle-class churches to hear how God is at work. Every time we run a story on what's happening in those uh, harder communities and we're hearing of baptisms, conversions, etc., people are delighted and encouraged. Do you know one of the reasons why? Because in middle-class churches, conversions are very few and far between. An awful lot of the growth in middle-class churches is transfer growth. Many are struggling with the discouragement of the apathy that surrounds them and the relatively little conversion growth that they're seeing. We need to be blessed by hearing how God is at work. We want to promote and support the conferences that you're running. We want to promote and support the opportunities that you give for people to gain best practice for working in poorer communities. We want to promote and support the um, uh, initiatives that you provide to train people to work in those contexts, both those who are indigenous and those who are from middle-class communities. We want to promote the opportunities, needs, and initiatives that come from poorer communities. Fourthly, we want to validate ministry in those poorer communities. Ministry in poorer communities might involve models of ministry, and we've been hearing this today, that are actually different from the models of ministry that are working in middle-class areas. What we don't want to do is create a culture in which a certain model of ministry is seen as always being right and biblical. It might be a kind of preaching. It might be a kind of discipleship. As we've heard, it might be a kind of model of uh, a a sort of a women's worker. It might be the very model of ministry itself, which privileges somebody who's full-time and has been to college for three years. In order to reach every community, we may well need very different models of ministry. And I think one of the things that we can do is validate all those different kinds of models of ministry and say that they are outworkings of what the Bible teaches about gospel ministry. They're not wrong or inadequate just because they're different. They actually may well be well-designed and contextualised for ministry in different situations. We mustn't create just one single model of ministry that is seen to be the norm and everything else is regarded as inadequate. Collectively, we can work to overcome that. And lastly and fifthly, we want to support. We want to help you get the resources that you need. As I've said, one of the things that's come back time and time again is the financial need and the need for people. Resources are crucial uh, for ministry. And uh, what I'd love us to be able to do is to mobilise our churches and individuals to give to support that gospel work. But I also want to say right at the beginning, FIEC is not a magic money tree. I wish it were, but it's not. In fact, um, FIEC has historically not had large amounts of money to distribute. We don't tax our churches to give to other churches. The donations our churches give us just cover our operating costs. We haven't had some massive fund to be able to kind of give away to uh, churches. Most of the money um, uh, that is given away to churches comes from um, individuals or trusts, not, not directly us. Having said that, it's not that we've done nothing. Over the last um, six years, we've given away about a million pounds uh, in training that we've received donations for from individuals. By rough calculation, about 43% of that has been given to churches and workers, not in middle-class areas. We've, in a sense, already deliberately wanted to use those resources to those who most need them. We've had a, a small amount of money that's come available to us for a mission fund from closed churches. Our biggest single grant was of £60,000 given to a church working in a hard place. Uh, What we've been able to do is we've been able to encourage partnership between churches. I think one of the things we can do is act as a a, a sort of an honest broker. Maybe, um, if you'll forgive the Ian illustration, a kind of a dating agency that can connect up churches that can give with those that are in need. So uh, a church in London received a very large legacy. They decided to give a significant amount of that money to a church in a hard place in Liverpool for a revitalisation. We were able to help bring that about. Uh, Not too long ago, we had an individual come to us who is not from the FIEC, from a very different denomination, who said, I've got £30,000 I want to invest in a church in a hard place. 
we haven't got many in our grouping, but you have. Where can I give my money? And we were able to connect that individual up with a church in a hard place that he is now supporting to a considerable degree. Just last week, I had an email from a student church in FIEC, quite a big uh, student church, saying, we want to commit to supporting a church in a hard place. Where would you recommend? Who could you introduce us to? I think there's real opportunity for building those partnerships between churches that will lead to real commitment, generous giving, prayer, support. We uh, were speaking to some of those from hard places. We run a leaders conference, and one of the comments that was made was, our, our teams can't afford to come. It costs 300 quid a throw to come to the conference and to stay there and to travel, uh, so we can't be there, so we feel excluded. Having listened to that, the result is we found a donor who's given us £10,000, which will fund 30 bursaries for people from hard places to be able to come to the leaders' conference, covering costs of the conference, accommodation, and travel. Speak to uh, Phil Topham on the uh, FIEC stand because we've got some cards there. And if you've got people in your church who you'd love to come to the conference who couldn't come without that support, we'd love you to be able to take advantage of it. It's one of those things that we're able um, to do. We want to, um, in a sense, build the trust that enables people to give generously to work in hard places. The honest reality is donors only give when there's trust established. Middle-class donors will only give to those that they trust will use their money well. And I think we can have a function of helping to build that trust, build those connections. I want to see generous donors who don't want to behave like controlling patrons. I get so frustrated with Christian fundraising that so often there are people who are willing to give, but only if it's on their terms, only if they have the power and the control. We need to kind of foster relationships where there is enough trust for people to give and also to give over the power that goes with the money they give. And I want to help bring about that uh, culture. We have, in more recent times, received some significant donations to invest in church planting and mission. Those funds have come from closed churches, and those funds have come from some uh, generous individuals. We're uh, building links with some churches in the States and churches in Korea. And my hope is that we will be able to receive more funds to be able to distribute. And we want to prioritize using those resources to fund gospel work in the most needy areas. The three we've identified are, are poorer communities, rural areas, and those which are ethnic communities. And as that money becomes available, those will be the places where we want to prioritize investing um, those resources. And we want to encourage our churches that are thriving and growing, those that are in middle class areas. Um, uh, because ministry is always hard and there's always more than you, that you could do, the temptation is to keep investing in yourself. We want to think, uh, encourage them to think about investing in gospel work elsewhere, giving away, because that's the biblical pattern. That's what the church in Philippi did. It gave away. That's what the churches in Achaia did. They gave away rather than investing in themselves, and we want to try to bring about that culture. So building trust, distributing um, resources. I don't know whether you realize this, but um, again, in terms of funding, my experience has been that you often think that the people who've got the money to give away are the big churches. My experience has been that the people who are sitting on money are often the small churches, particularly the small dying churches that have got a big amount of money in the bank that's been accumulated over years that's not being used for the gospel. We want that money to be liberated, to be able to use in, be invested in thriving gospel work. So what would I love to see? What would I love to see over the next few years? Well, I'd love to see every single FIEC church partnering with a church in one of those needy places. Committing to pray for them, engage with them, learn from them, give to them. I think that could be a really effective way of supporting ministry in those areas. That's, I think, the biblical pattern. And I think we as an agency are capable of bringing that about. But let me end, um, if you would, if, with just a couple of cautions. And I hope you'll um, uh, sort of uh, indulge me and I ask for your understanding. I think one thing that's crucial to grasp is we just need to grasp it takes time to change a culture. 
cultures don't change overnight, even when a need has been identified. Changing a culture is a long-term thing. Just read in the Bible how much time it took for the church to come to terms with the Gentiles being brought into the church. This is going to take time to change, and it's easy to become frustrated and think that nothing is happening, whereas in actual fact, cultures take time to change. Don't assume that we don't care just because you don't see the change that you would like at the speed that you want. So it's very helpful, Andy, just talking about the need in uh, those kind of um, ministries in, 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 work, in harder areas to be slowing down. It's actually the same with changing the culture of evangelicalism as a whole or any major ministry like the FIEC. Secondly, it is inevitable that not everyone will get on board. Not everyone will buy into the vision. You have to build with those who are willing, those who get it. You won't be able to persuade everyone, and at one level you just have to let go of that and work with those whom God um, is laying it on their hearts to get behind you. Thirdly, resources will always be limited. Resources will always be limited. They'll never be enough. And actually, growing gospel work always means a growth of a need of resources. We're never going to reach a point at which there's actually a plethora of resources. So we're always going to be having to make difficult decisions about prioritization. We're always going to be having to choose the best from the possible. That's inevitable. And lastly, we need to be generous to those with the same goals. Even if we don't have the same strategy, actually fighting against one another will not advance the cause as a whole. There will be multiple ways of advancing the gospel into hard communities. It's a hard task to change the culture of a wider evangelicalism. And we need to be generous and affirming to those who share the common goal. I hope that gives you something of a flavor of what it might begin to look like in practice to make reaching into these needy communities a priority. That's certainly where we would like it to be for the FIEC. And we would hope that as we do that, there will be other agencies, other groupings, other networks that will want to share our heart as well.